Chapter 15 of A Gringo in Manana Land by Harry L. Foster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Where Marines Make Presidents. Part 2. 6. The story of the American cooperation, which the Nicaraguans themselves describe by a less pleasant word, dates back to 1909. At that time, Nicaragua had a dictator, Jose Santos Zelaya, had been re-electing himself president for 17 years. He had commenced his reign, stern though it was, with fairness and justice toward his countrymen and friendliness towards foreigners. In his later years, overwhelmed with conceit at his success, he came to regard his dictatorship as a right that carried with it the privilege to amuse himself as he saw fit. If he needed money, he horsewhipped the wealthier merchants until they offered a voluntary contribution. If he saw a woman he desired, he sent for her to come to the palace. Presently he commenced to meddle in his neighbor's affairs, fomenting revolutions in the adjoining countries and thumbing his nose at the United States. In 1909, a revolution started in his own country, over at the isolated port of Bluefields on the Caribbean coast. There are rumors that it had the backing of American capitalists. These rumors arise from the fact that Adolfo Diaz, then the treasurer of the revolution, and later the leading actor in the drama, was an humble employee of an American concern. Diaz denies these rumors. Every penny, he told me in Managua, was contributed by Nicaraguans but certain it is that the revolution had the sympathy of the united states government president taft at the time frankly described zelaya in a message to congress as an international nuisance and when during the fighting the zelisas executed two american soldiers of fortune caught red-handed attempting to dynamite troop ships on the san juan river the American government made this trivial incident the pretext for hinting broadly that it was time for Zelaya to resign. Zelaya did resign, leaving the presidency in the hands of an excellent man, backed by all the old lieutenants of the Zelaista party. The United States was not satisfied. And when the Zelaistas, having licked the revolutionists to a frazzle, were about to take their stronghold in Bluefields, an American gunboat intervened on the ground that further fighting might destroy American property. From some mysterious source, which all Latin America believes to be the United States, the revolutionists obtained new ammunition. They sallied out from Bluefields again thrashed the Zelaistas, and overturned the government. One General Estrada, the leader of the insurrection, became president, but he soon gave way to Adolfo Diaz, now enters upon the scene, the American banker. President Diaz found the country bankrupt. There is much controversy as to how the debt originated, each party blaming it on the other. The truth is that Zelaya had left several millions in the treasury because he had just negotiated a loan with British bankers and had not had time to spend it. He also left a long list of claims because of his high-handed confiscation of property. The revolutionists had doubled the bill by their own destruction of property during the warfare. Wherefore, blame is divided. The important fact is that Don Adolfo found his country in debt to the extent of over $32 million, a staggering sum to a small republic. He called upon a firm of New York bankers for a loan of $15 million. This transaction was arranged through the American State Department by a treaty which the Senate, newly turned Democratic when Wilson replaced Taft, refused to ratify. Nicaragua, however, regarded it as an agreement. As security for the loan, the bankers took over the collection of the customs and arranged to look after the whole business of the national debt. They never advanced the loan. They did advance a million and a half, followed by comparatively trifling sums to stabilize the currency and reorganize the national bank, but they also took over the bank. Later, when another million was advanced, they took over the operation of the Nicaraguan railway. 
president diaz now retired to civil life assumes full responsibility for these transactions he is a pleasant little gentleman with graying hair and a frank boyish smile i asked the bankers to do it i was taking the only means i had to bring my country out of financial chaos but i became as a result the most hated man in nicaragua in fact all nicaragua called him a traitor accused him of selling the republic to the american capitalists and rose to overthrow him for three days in nineteen twelve the rest of the country poured cannonballs into managua until president diaz asked the united states for protection two thousand american marines were promptly landed having suppressed the revolution they left a legation guard in managua as an intimation that the united states stood ready to suppress any further uprisings indirectly these marines make presidents today elections in nicaragua are as much a farce as in mexico whoever controls the polls wins the verdict wherefore the conservative party which first invited the american bankers has remained steadily in power it can be defeated only by revolution which the marines prevent you ought to be here at election time said an old american resident and see them run their voters from one booth to another by the truckload they number about one-tenth of the population but they always win if the marines were withdrawn even the conservatives themselves admitted to me the present government would be overthrown within twenty-four hours nicaragua as a whole never endorsed the invitation to the american capitalists when the conservatives invited them the entire country turned liberal if zelaya were to come to life and return to managua he would find the republic waiting with open arms but while the marines are present the liberals are helpless at the time of my visit another election campaign was starting realizing their dependence upon washington the liberals had effected a change of heart announcing that they would support the bankers as ardently as the conservatives and asking for a new election law which would keep their opponents from stuffing the ballot boxes a new law had been drafted by a new york lawyer the liberals were hopeful but uncertain who will be your candidate i asked one of their leaders we do not know yet he said we have not heard who will be most acceptable to washington during my several weeks in managua i talked with most of the actors who had played leading roles in the international drama i do not believe that the united states was guilty of a deep-laid plot to gain possession of the little republic i believe that the american government acted for the best interests of the nicaraguans but when one reviews the train of events since nineteen o nine one sees at a glance that they can very easily be misinterpreted until they look decidedly nasty first came a revolution assisted by an american gunboat which doubled the already overwhelming national debt then came american bankers taking charge of the national debt and exacting as security everything of value in the republic then came the american marines keeping in power the minority party that invited the bankers against the will of nicaragua itself and all latin america chooses to regard these events as part of a deep-laid program of intrigue seven there are always two sides to a question nicaragua under american supervision has made progress but it is a progress which both to the permanent resident and the casual tourist is altogether invisible outwardly since the coming of the bankers the republic has marked time no large industries have been introduced no railways have been built the greater part of the country is without means of communication or development the cities are in worse repair than those of honduras and although the bankers deny it every nicaraguan and nearly every foreign resident proclaims that the country is far less prosperous today than in the worst days of zelaya this is largely due to the fact that the bankers administering nicaragua's finances are devoting all their attention to clearing up the old national debt colonel clifford d ham the american collector of customs has reduced this debt from over thirty two million dollars to less than nine million there is no country in the world except the united states whose finances are today in such flourishing condition as those of nicaragua but this means nothing to the average native 
no latin american is ever roused individually to a high pitch of enthusiasm over the prospect of paying what he owes collectively he finds the idea quite objectionable particularly when the indebtedness was contracted a long time ago and so he says these americans turn aside at our very gates every penny that would otherwise flow into the country they are draining the very life-blood from the nation he points to the fact that when the american government a few years ago purchased the rights to build a nicaraguan canal at some time in the future and paid therefore three million dollars the money never left new york but was applied immediately upon that infernal debt the national bank has stabilized the currency so that the nicaraguan cordoba is on a bar with the american dollar according to the bankers there's more money in circulation today in nicaragua than ever before but the nicaraguan insists that prices have risen so that he now can buy only half as much as in the days of zelaya forgetting that prices have risen throughout the world all the money is in the bank and i cannot obtain credit without giving security the latin is not a hard cold business man he resents these business-like methods he curses the commerciality of the gingo the railway when the americans took it over was a total wreck the employees had not been paid for two weeks since there was just two dollars and forty-nine cents in the cash drawer the names of thirty-five dead men were found still on the payroll some of the locomotive engineers were barefoot most of the workers had to draw their salary in the form of an i o u which could be cashed at a twenty per cent discount at the office of a local pawnbroker every one of any political prominence expected a pass the more influential were accustomed to private cars or to the courtesy of having the regular passenger train stop to wait several hours for them while they paid visits along the line today the road is in good shape it operates systematically as railways should operate it operates also at a profit instead of a deficit and is earning money which is steadily rebuying itself back into the hands of the nicaraguan government but the nicaraguan is suspicious whenever the american manager buys a new locomotive the newspapers proclaim that he's done so to run up the bills in order that nicaragua cannot regain control of the road some day in the near future the american capitalist will retire leaving nicaragua in excellent shape for progress since the latin american lives completely in the present the nicaraguan cannot appreciate work that builds for future prosperity he sees no visible result of the american cooperation he knows only that his country has been at a standstill since the americans came he loudly damns the gringo and all latin america echoes his accusations against the scheming colossus of the north so unfortunately does many an american resident in nicaragua eight nicaragua is a lowland of tropical heat it has the least invigorating climate in central america the natives are not particularly blessed with energy or industry and are consequently rather eager to blame their lack of initiative to the stifling effect of their subserviency to the united states individually they are quite ready to be friendly to any american collectively they love to damn the gringos and the newspapers of managua and leon cater regularly to their taste by soaking every yankee who attains prominence in the republic these papers like the dailies of guatemala are mostly four-sheet publications with the flavor of rural journalism they are printed usually at a loss by gentlemen of political aspirations who desire an organ for self-expression the reporters inspired by the same vanity editorialize in every news report in mentioning the arrival of an actress they felicitate her and wish her success in describing the arrest of some petty criminal they express the hope that he may be convicted and hanged and dealt with not too leniently in purgatory in attacking americans however they reach their highest flights of eloquence no article on politics or finance is complete without an allusion to the oppressive hand of the american banker and when the banker has been exhausted as a source of indignant outpourings they give their attention to the other american residents 
on one occasion they flamed out against young rene wallace the son of a yankee merchant because he had organized a league of basketball clubs among the young ladies of nicaraguan society they proclaimed indignantly that he was trying to deprive the local senoritas of all modesty and gentleness by arraying them in bloomers and teaching them the hoydenish games wherein no self-respecting woman could indulge on another occasion they flamed out against dr daniel m malloy of the rockefeller foundation because the name of rockefeller suggested to them another capitalistic invasion this foundation has been active throughout central america particularly in combating hookworm wherewith nearly all the barefoot inhabitants are infected it suppressed a yellow fever epidemic which swept throughout these countries in nineteen eighteen it has built hospitals improved water supplies taught hygiene and worked in many other ways for the betterment of the various republics the ignorant peons indifferent to hygiene had always regarded sickness and disease as something inevitable to be accepted with fatalistic patience in infant mortality mexico surpasses all the world's civilized communities while its total death rate is thrice that of the united states and it is safe to assume that the central american republics in the absence of statistics keep pace with mexico the educated masses have never made much effort to relieve this situation in Tegucigalpa, a recently appointed director of a government hospital had to begin his work by removing forty-two cans of garbage left in the hospital patio by the last director the rockefeller foundation there in employing a new native physician of high standing in the community discovered that he had never studied bacteriology and had but a vague idea that any diseases were caused by germs in lands where such conditions prevail the foundation should have been hailed as a godsend especially since it came largely at its own expense but a newspaper in leon published daily editorials attacking dr malloy and insisting that rockefeller would presently be demanding oil concessions when no such demands were forthcoming the editor found another argument in the fact that dr malloy was advocating new methods in sewage disposal aha he cried on his front page we see the nigger in the woodpile this gringo is a secret representative of a manufacturing firm that hopes to sell us american plumbing devices nine at the time of my sojourn in managua there was a temporary lull in such attacks for the city was indulging in its semi-annual outburst of culture the aristocrats of central america are very fond of theatrical entertainment and some of the republics have built national theatres but such is the expense of bringing artistes from europe that performances are rare and usually subsidized by the government frijolita who had danced before all the crowned heads of europe had recently been performing in Tegucigalpa the honduran government having paid her expenses to the country had allowed her to get out as best she could whereupon she was now about to dance in the neighboring capitals all nicaragua felt honored every poet in the country tuned his lyre and prepared to sing her praises in central america nearly every one who can write is a poet the composition of verses is a universal indoor sport among the young men on sunday each newspaper devotes a page to the unremunerated efforts of the local bards guests at the hotels seeing me scribbling in a notebook always inquired whether i were writing verses every one who can afford the luxury prints privately his musings which no one else ever seems to read when it became known that frijolita would dance the editors themselves took a crack at versification and published their outpourings neatly boxed on the first sheet i shared my hotel room with bosco the tenor and maestro the orchestra conductor frijolita stopping at the most expensive hotel had dispatched them to the sort of hostelry where itinerant travel writers were forced to stay and they were much incensed but to our room came the minor devotees of art from the nicaraguan population to bask in their glory 
and both bosco and maestro entertained them with stories of frijolito's absurd temperament and with sly comments about her age suggesting that she had not really danced before a crowned head since napoleon bonaparte went into exile bosco was a cheerful person he was small and rotund but he sang divinely and was not stingy with his accomplishment in the early morning he poked a bleary countenance from his mosquito net and greeted the indian servant maid with an aria then he would stroll out into the patio in his pajamas carrying his guitar to serenade the other ladies of the establishment maestro was a withered elderly person once famous but fallen into obscurity he was taciturn and unsociable his one love was his fiddle he would stroll away by himself to the back regions of the hotel where he found inspiration in the banana trees and the rubbish heap and there he would evoke weird squeals from his instrument in an effort to perfect what he described as a new technique friolita remained at the more expensive hotel giving out daily interviews to the press about the many royal zions who had committed suicide because she could not respond to their love her husband sometimes came to call upon us he was a dapper little fellow his hair was very long his face was always neatly powdered his smile was endearing he would greet us with a gentle wave of the hand or a gesture of his cane ask after our health and withdraw gracefully a vision of dainty silken-clad ankles leaving a trail of haunting perfume behind him a week elapsed maestro devoted it to informing his acquaintances that frijolito was treating him like a dog then came the much-awaited debut the theatre was a shabby structure of european design its two balconies consisting of boxes and loges where sat the ladies of society the unattached men filled the pit many with their hats on craning their necks to stare aloft we waited an hour and a half for the president he finally arrived everyone rose the orchestra played the national anthem it was greeted with vast applause little withered maestro turned and bowed then the orchestra played again that piece about daybreak or springtime or something wherein the trap drummer usually toots about a bird whistle here the trap drummer had no bird whistle but the curtain went up just the same revealing a conventional backdrop and a huddled mass of plumes in the foreground which proved to be none other than friolita herself apparently asleep more applause thunderous applause it awakened frijolita very slowly she rose from the floor and commenced to undulate at some time in the distant past one sensed that she had been a great dancer nowadays one felt that she had reached the stage where she ought to interpret only the classics she was just a bit too heavy to do popular stuff but she was game she undulated faster and faster she flitted and romped and turned somersaults applause became a roar of approval the music ceased she bowed leaped behind the curtain emerged in a spanish shawl unwound it and threw it away leaped back behind the curtain emerged in another shawl there were fourteen shawls to be unwound while the roar grew to a tumult then she was gone bosco who was not singing to-night came out of the wings and hurried through the auditorium with a preoccupied air to let the public know he was connected in some way with the troupe while maestro acknowledged with grateful genuflections the approval of the spectators it was an exhibition such as might be seen in any second-rate vaudeville house on broadway as a curtain raiser but it was an event in managua most of the nicaraguans recognized it as an inferior performance but outwardly they maintained an air of joyous appreciation largely patriotic frijolita had no support troop there was a brief intermission then she broke loose again this time she displayed an elephantine pair of bare legs and the roar of approval increased again and again she danced interpreting thereby according to the program the latest wiggles of every land from egypt to japan she came finally to her masterpiece the genuine hawaiian hula hula 
and then occurred the unexpected climax maestro either by accident or malicious design stopped his music too soon leaving her with one foot in the air frijolita flew into a rage her far-famed temperament burst all bounds rushing to front stage she screamed revilement at the musician all managua cheered her rising in his wrath maestro screamed revilement at her and all managua cheered him friolita was outraged she seized such pieces of scenery as were not nailed down and commenced to hurl them the president feeling that the whole affair was beneath his dignity took his departure friolita's husband came teetering forward to mediate que pasa he inquired pleasantly what's the trouble friolita glared at him what sort of a man are you why don't you defend me he fled before another shower of scenery and friolita fled after him managua carried the little maestro out upon its shoulders and treated him to champagne delighted at the unanticipated entertainment he had offered but the next day the local papers did not mention the incident perhaps the editors felt that they must maintain appearances and that managua's semi-annual outburst of culture should pass off in the press at least with eclat or perhaps they had already composed their poems and could not deny themselves the satisfaction of publishing them for the verses appeared neatly boxed on the first page eulogizing the performance of the incomparable artiste friolita End of chapter 15 part 2「Where Marines Make Presidents」Part 3 10. Managua of late has gone in for sports. The Marines have taught the natives to box and to play baseball. In the latter game, the Nicaraguan boys invariably defeat their mentors. In boxing, they still have much to learn, but they are promising. The newspapers write up the events with a Latin American flavor. In the advertisement of a baseball match, the public is advised not to miss a wonderful sporting event, colossal stealing of bases, lightning-like flight of ball from pitcher to catcher, formidable blows of the bat, thrilling to the emotions do not miss it do not miss it to the field on sunday at the ten of the morning to the field baseball is firmly established boxing has long been opposed in latin america as a brutal amusement suitable only to gringos but it has gained much popularity since the advent of firpo one sunday afternoon i drifted out to the field to see the local champions there was a rickety grandstand but the ring stood far away from it in the centre of a bare pasture if one wished a ringside seat one could take a camp chair and move it wherever we pleased everyone started back in the shade of the stand and edged his seat forward as the shadows lengthened finally reaching the ring in time for the final bout the promoter acted as introducer and referee he was a prominent local politician a large stout gentleman in a big leather sombrero he commenced with two diminutive urchins who knew nothing of boxing they fought so gamely that they were fagged before the end of the first round but they struggled through three of them obtaining additional rest while the promoter explained that they must not kick or bite and then returning to the fray to put both hands together and shove them toward the adversary's face next came two older boys then two full-grown men one barefoot one in shoes and silk shirt the barefoot one a wild-looking indian with dark face and long hair had evidently learned his strategy by watching gamecocks he kept edging sideways as though he did not see the other fellow he would start his swing by winding up like a baseball pitcher the other could always see it coming and leap aside but it was an unwieldy swing, and the other invariably jumped into it until his silk shirt was crimson. The spectators were delighted. They could not appreciate science, but they recognized blood when they saw it and screamed their approval. The Indian won.
Then came the semi-finals and the finals. Here the participants were trained to some extent, but they were handicapped by Latin vanity. They were constantly posing before the crowd. Between the rounds, instead of resting, they would turn to their admirers to make a speech. He got me by accident last time, but I'll show you something when the bell rings. If one were knocked to the floor, instead of taking his count of nine, even when he sadly needed it, he would leap immediately to his feet, determined to redeem himself in the eyes of his followers. Or one of them, having backed the other against the ropes and pummeled him to a pulp, would forego his advantage to listen to the applause. But these men were fighters. The old phrase, the fistless Latin, is rapidly becoming obsolete. These scrappers never stalled or clenched to save themselves or to gain time. They fought harder than any American pugilist, and they had infinite courage. In the final bout, one youth was greatly outweighed. His opponent cut his eye in the very first round so that he was almost blinded. Even the Nicaraguan spectators, much as they loved gore, suggested that the battle should stop. But the little fellow insisted on continuing. He was beaten into a bloody mess, knocked down again and again, pounded until it became a torture, but he never wavered. The moment he gained his feet, he rushed forward courageously for additional punishment with a fortitude that no Anglo-Saxon could surpass. In many phases of life, these people acquit themselves as poor sportsmen, especially in their politics, but they are learning sportsmanship after all is not a hereditary virtue but one acquired through experience what american cannot recall the many squabbles that marked his earliest boyhood ventures into athletics it is only by training that one learns to abide by the decision of an umpire i was rather amazed to notice that not one of the nicaraguan boxers contested the decision of the referee eleven the one american resident that the managua newspapers do not occasionally attack is the marine some years ago one periodical published an editorial accusing the legation guard of general misconduct whereupon the soldiers promptly wrecked its plant no such accusations have been repeated there are about a hundred and fifty marines in managua they are the cleanest cut body of young men that i had ever seen anywhere there was no drunkenness among them, no rough house, no swaggering or bullying attitude toward the natives, no tendency to pick a fight with the local police. The only difficulty we ever have, said the American minister, John E. Rahmer, is that now and then one of them falls in love with a Nicaraguan senorita. The lad might be able to support her in her accustomed luxury here, but he couldn't do it at home. Consequently, for the best interests of both parties, the officers, if they see it coming, try to cheat Cupid by transferring the man to another post. The barracks are situated on the outskirts of town. The men are well quartered, with drill grounds, club, baseball diamond, moving picture theater, and tennis courts, and so completely comfortable that a Nicaraguan president, paying a visit to the camp, once threw up his hands in astonishment with the exclamation, Your privates live like generals. Adjacent to their cantonment is that of the Nicaraguan soldiers. I strolled over to the native barracks one day with Corporal Landy, the legation orderly. Hello, you bandits, he greeted them, and all the Nicaraguans grinned. These devils, he explained to me in Spanish, that they might hear, never have any drill or fatigue or anything else to do except to sit around and watch us sweat. And they all chuckled good-humouredly as though they liked it. Very casually he took the gun away from a native sentry to show me the rust upon it. And that cannon they have there, if you were to fire it, would turn a somersault and land on its back. They talked together on friendly terms about the night last year when a revolution was expected. Each had the other covered with machine guns in case of an emergency. They laughed about it now, and each assures the other, I was aiming straight at you that night. I attended an inspection one Saturday morning. The Rochester, previously at Amapala, had reached Corinto, and Admiral Dayton came up to inspect the troops. 
there was a close order drill then extended order then fire call and finally the call to arms wherein every man took the post he would take in case of actual fighting in managua the bugle rang out there was a scurrying of machine gunners to the various emplacements about the barracks down by the front entrance the sallying party formed to charge with fixed bayonets through the streets of managua just across the line the nicaraguan troops sat cross-legged on the ground and grinned appreciatively as though they felt that this was an exhibition staged for their personal entertainment they themselves were never called upon to practice for such emergencies when the marines first did it some years ago the native soldiers had all scurried back into the barracks to get their own guns while an anxious presidential voice came over the telephone wire to the american legation demanding what's the matter in your camp your marines are running about like madmen are they declaring war upon us they soon assembled again and marched back to the barracks while the band played dixie and the stars and stripes floated in the breeze this whole occupation because of its aspect and foreign eyes was a thing that might be deplored but what yankee in a faraway land would not be thrilled at the sight twelve it is natural that the nicaraguan resents american intervention there exists in the latin american's character a combination of inefficiency and pride which induces the inferiority complex his inefficiency sometimes leads him into a muddle from which he is unable to extricate himself he invites the foreigner to help him out then his pride asserts itself he resents the fact that he has been obliged to call upon the foreigner he proceeds thereupon to damn him during my stay in managua the rumor circulated about an ever-recurrent rumor there that the marines were to be withdrawn inside of an hour the american legation was filled with diplomats from foreign countries and merchants who owned property in nicaragua all anxious to know if the rumor were true all fearful of the destructive revolution that would follow overnight all eager to protest against the withdrawal of the much abused gringos in the crowd were many nicaraguans who had been loudest in their condemnation of the united states thirteen like most persons with the inferiority complex the latin american is extremely sensitive he resents even more than the humiliation of gringo assistance the assumption of loftier worth which usually characterizes the anglo-saxon this assumption to us is often quite unconscious if we are aware of our national self-satisfaction most of us try to hide it when traveling in the southern republics our diplomats and businessmen seek valiantly to proclaim our great admiration of our neighbors it has become the fashion in our writing to promote an entente cordiale by flattering the people of these countries the charming woman writer in particular who makes a brief trip to the more modern cities of chile and the argentine meets only the aristocracy and completes her book as a bread and butter letter to the delightful people who fed her tea and cakes is inclined nowadays in her impulse to jolt out of his complacency the reader at home to picture all the latin americans as infinitely superior to our own crude selves yet all of us even though we may have acquired a strong affection for our friends of the southland still consider ourselves their peers we know that every gringo is not to be ranked above every latin american but we are confident that man for man lawyer for lawyer doctor for doctor soldier for soldier farmer for farmer the anglo-saxon usually surpasses his counterpart in physique intelligence education ability and character if not in refinement the latin american himself is aware of the contrast he may and sometimes does voluntarily admit it but he is naturally a trifle resentful when the gringo by word or action reminds him of it we remind him quite frequently the most considerate traveller will lapse unintentionally at times into an attitude of condescension our kindly churchgoers at home contribute their pennies to missionary enterprises in order that he may be educated and uplifted and as though this were not the supreme height of international insult 
however much he may actually need education and uplift we appoint ourselves the policemen of the continent take him under our paternal wing and threaten to spank him if he misbehaves we assume that he should appreciate our kindliness and love us as the big brother we consider ourselves to be on the contrary he not only dislikes us as a nation but distrusts our motives he looks upon us and frequently with good cause as hypocrites who pat him upon the back as a prelude to selling him american products in our missionary efforts he sees only a colossal national vanity in the application of our monroe doctrine he scents an ambition for the conquest of his country to the average american this last statement may sound ridiculous when we promulgated that doctrine we thought only of europe it was later when we realized that european nations might disregard it unless their citizens or property were protected in latin america that we undertook to supervise the conduct of our neighbors wars and revolutions our ambitions for conquest at present are purely commercial but there are several incidents in our past history which these little republics remember with foreboding they remember for instance that we fought with mexico about texas and emerged victorious with arizona utah nevada and california they feel that there is something a little funny in the way panama started its revolution against columbia just about the time we wished to build the panama canal they question our philanthropic motives in nicaragua they are always wondering where the lightning may strike next so firmly convinced are most of our neighbors that we are what they always describe us as the grasping colossus of the north that when our government exercises forbearance they merely suspect us of cowardice when woodrow wilson for many years let mexico literally get away with murder his idealism was misunderstood for a time latin america looked upon the united states as a braggart that never executed its repeated diplomatic threats Carranza, the special protégé of our State Department, posed before the neighboring presidents as a guardian of Latin American rights, and had envoys touring the southern continent in an effort to align Guatemala, Nicaragua, Colombia, Chile, Argentina, and other countries in a secret entente against the United States. Personally, I dislike our meddling in Latin American affairs it seems to me that it should be any government's privilege to run a revolution in its own country if it so chooses but there are many gringos in all these republics who came there in accordance with local constitutional guarantees and sometimes at the invitation of the government itself who must be protected if we do not occasionally step in europe will latin america with the exception of the few nations which conduct their elections in peace expects it the latin american resents it but he despises us when we abstain if we are to uphold our prestige however we must apply our foreign policies whatever they may be to all republics consistently we never know just what to expect from your government a supreme court justice said to me in honduras you tell us again and again for instance that you will recognize only a constitutionally elected president who gains office without force yet to-day you have recognized nine latin american presidents who did gain office by force these were the presidents of peru bolivia venezuela nicaragua salvador honduras guatemala santo domingo and mexico and you tell us also continued the justice that at all times we must protect american property if we of the little countries do not you immediately send down your gunboats in nicaragua two american filibusters convicted of murder are executed and presently you take over the entire country in mexico during many revolutions countless americans are slain and much property damaged and you content yourselves with writing notes to us of the little countries it all seems very unfair as to the recognition of latin american presidents heaven help the state department to apply a consistent rule when so few are legitimately elected but as to the protection of american property there can be but one right course either it is not worth protecting or it is whether it be in nicaragua or mexico 
practically all central americans today although too polite to voice their opinion look upon us as something of a bully who picks on the weaker republics fourteen that they are so friendly despite their fancied grievances is a tribute to the natural kindliness of these people even in nicaragua although the press may attack the gringo the people as a whole are cordial to any individual american who will meet them half way i went home last year said one of the old-timers i'd been here for ten years but no one in my own town seemed to make much of a fuss over me they just shook hands and remarked let's see you've been away haven't you but when i came back and stepped off the train in managua every porter and coachman on the platform recognized me the bootblacks grinned all over their dirty brown faces and my neighbors all came hurrying to my house to hug me and slap me on the back and make those funny gurgling noises that was my real homecoming end of chapter fifteen part three Chapter 16 of A Gringo in Manana Land by Harry L. Foster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 A Long, Long Way to Costa Rica. Part 1. 1. I set out overland through the Nicaraguan Canal for Costa Rica. From Managua, the railway carried me to Granada on the shores of the largest lake between Michigan and Titicaca at the end of a long wharf the weekly steamer was balancing itself upon its prow and waving its stern in the air lashed by a gale that piled the combers one upon another until the pond resembled a young ocean it was a squatty vessel condemned back in the days of zelaya but still running it contained several bullet holes from the revolution that overthrew the dictator when attacked it had been so crowded with government troops that most of them could not fire upon the enemy whereupon they had relieved their emotions by shooting upward through the decks embarking passengers were looking forward to seasickness the latin americans always enjoy this malady even when the sea is calm upon going aboard a ship the women folk especially prepare for it by hanging upon the cabin wall a picture of our lady of voyagings reciting the rosary sniffing the smelling salts lying down upon the berth turning green and suffering miserably long before the ship leaves port such behavior seems to be regarded as essential to the gentle feminine character and i sometimes suspect that any lady who failed to show the proper symptoms during the voyage would be regarded as just a trifle masculine on this trip they all had excellent excuse the boat rocked and pitched frantically at its moorings when we finally steamed off our course lay broadside to the waves and the vessel dipped one gunwale after another soaking the steerage passengers on the lower deck and sprinkling those above they huddled together in a dejected uncomfortable mass of humanity groaning ay 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 and obtaining therefrom about as much relief as anglo-saxon find in oh 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 lake nicaragua is a hundred miles long by forty wide since it was a twenty-four hour journey much agony was enjoyed by all two i landed the next morning at san carlos at the mouth of the san juan river there was nothing of interest here except an ancient spanish fortress and j c kennedy they built the fortress back in sixteen hundred and something or maybe it was seventeen hundred and something explained the latter i know it was just before i came here mr kennedy a little white-haired irish-american who now owned a shoe shop and pegged away himself for exercise had twice been chased out of nicaragua by the old tyrant zelaya but i don't know as i blame him so much he said i had a factory making ammunition for the revolutionists three from san carlos the san juan river led eastward toward the caribbean once seriously considered by the american government as a possible site for the canal finally constructed at panama it was at present so shallow that only small launches could navigate it 
one was now waiting with a scow lashed to its side i sailed with it at midnight along with some forty other passengers mostly women and children all of us tightly packed into whatever spaces remained among the bags boxes and bales of a heavy cargo there was neither comfort nor privacy the latin americans with characteristic vanity had all embarked in their very best clothes now that they had parted from their friends and wished to change into garments better suited to a long voyage they faced a disconcerting problem the women cried out gentlemen please look the other way a host of infants whined and fretted every one turned and twisted about in an effort to find a position conducive to sleep until the launch suggested a cheese alive with squirming maggots i retired to the lighter and discovered a sheltered nook among the sacks of beans rolled up in my blanket there was a splendid moon overhead the black jungle illumined now and then with patches of misty gray slid past in mysterious procession at times i would awaken as the motor stopped and the native boatmen climbed over me to guide us with long poles through rippling shallows sometimes the claw-like branches of a half-submerged tree came racing at us as though shooting upstream to seize us there would be much frantic shouting and furious work with the guide poles as we dodged it then i would settle back to another nap lulled by the music of swift waters and pitying the other passengers huddled in cramped discomfort aboard the launch but the pity was premature without warning the heavens opened up and poured down a perfect deluge of chilling rain and i found myself the only passenger not under a roof and with no space left under the awning i had not known that every season was rainy season on the san juan and the deluge fell intermittently throughout the night drawing the blanket over my head i burrowed down between two bean sacks where presently a boatman rushing across the scow with his pole gave a leap and planted both bare feet in my face pardon senor but you looked like part of the cargo in the morning we docked at puerto castillo a string of aged wooden shanties bordering the river shrouded in an unceasing drizzle of mist there were some especially dangerous rapids here and the women were landed while the rest of us charged downstream through boiling foam our launch bumped and grated over the rocks as we plunged through the shallow falls but the current swept us on and we came finally into deeper pools below where the women straggling along the shore trail rejoined us and crawled over one another as each sought to find her own baggage among the mixture of sacks bundles baskets and boxes and to extract therefrom the ingredients for breakfast each passenger foraged for himself for three days we chugged downstream through rank green jungle with bits of fog clinging to its edges through shallows and rapids through drizzling showers every one had taken the precaution to bring food which we ate without cooking now and then if we stopped at a thatched hut a native woman could be persuaded to boil coffee but it was seldom that we stopped long enough with both sexes packed tightly into an open launch for many hours at a time there was necessary a complete abandonment of the modesties which civilized society regards as imperative when passengers complained the captain agreed with them sympathetically in the fatalistic fashion of these people as though he felt that the discomfort were something to be deplored but not to be remedied the captain was in reality a colonel by title several of the men passengers were generals most nicaraguans of any social standing have a military title of some sort earned in a long past revolution two or three of the women were the wives of government officials stationed in bluefields or other isolated east coast towns and were ladies of refinement but contiguity was productive of democracy and both ladies and generals joined the peons in lamentation of common misery the life of the party was a stout woman with a machete in the bosom of her voluminous soiled shirtwaist 
her seven children were constantly tumbling about over the other passengers to the annoyance of every one and her admonitions that she would cut their throats if they did not sit still illustrated by a waving of the machete had little effect upon them on the lake steamer she had led the mournful chorus of ay 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 but she was now in good spirits and prepared at all times to conduct the conversation her favourite theme was her romances the oldest boy he of the curly hair was the son of juanito the blacksmith and that one the dark one is the child of pedro the little indian at san carlos she had left the blacksmith it seems because he caught her at flirtation and failed to chastise the other man he had simply taken her home and beaten her she had not minded this for it was justified but he should have beaten the other man too did we not think so and who could love such a coward we stopped on our third night at a little thatched farmhouse while the women remained aboard the launch reciting their rosaries in unison as was their nightly custom throughout the voyage the men adjourned to a narrow sand spit opened a jug of rum and took turns riding a young bull which despite its youth contrived to toss most of them into the river thereafter we gathered at the farmhouse where some one produced guitar and mandolin and we all danced with the farmer's three daughters there was some question in my mind as to whether a gentleman about to dance with a barefoot partner should remove his own shoes the book of etiquette as i recalled it had not covered this point but considering that the boards were full of splinters which might have been painful to anybody but the calloused soul of a native i decided to forego the courtesy when the boatmen and passengers discovered that i could play a few pieces of their own music on the mandolin they hailed me as paisano fellow countryman and thereafter called me by that name these nicaraguans were prejudiced against gringos but like all latin americans were eager to be friendly with any individual who showed an interest in themselves one of the generals could speak english his hobby was collecting the pictures of short-skirted movie actresses that came with each package of the cigarettes i smoked though the american girl are some nifty girl eh all the time i am in a wave in new york i go always to the dance hall to shake the the what you call it the wicked hip and so much i like the scenic railway at the coney island and one that go all the way through the dark tunnel some classy burg that nueva york when the rain ceased momentarily the men would ascend to the roof of the launch among the crates of squawking chickens that formed the bulk of the cargo and from that point of vantage would shoot at the alligators lying half submerged along the mud flats the caymans were sluggish creatures on the amazon and other rivers i have seen much larger monsters disappear with the crack of a rifle here they merely lumbered with awkward dignity toward the water the boatmen showed no fear of them when we struck a sandbar as we did at two-hour intervals the crew would leap overboard to shove us loose and sometimes would plod all over the river to find the deeper channels if this were ever to become an interoceanic canal it would require infinite dredging yet should traffic outgrow the panama waterway this will be the site of another road the mountain chain which soars aloft throughout central america subsides at this point lake nicaragua is only a hundred and ten feet above sea level and from it another river empties into the pacific just as the san juan empties into the caribbean the principal disadvantage of a canal here would be its length any surveyor or engineer making the journey as i made it would swear that the san juan was longer than the mississippi four it was a relief when after three days of it we turned aside into a narrow channel and pushed our way through lily pads to the weather-stained city of san juan del norte otherwise known as Greytown, our caribbean terminus it was merely the typical east coast town however low swampy stinking and generally unattractive with black complexions prevailing the nicaraguan commandante was spanish all other officials were negroes 
a customs inspector of west indian descent as immaculate in white linen uniform as only a colored official can be directed me to a lodging-house and i set out to find it hiking along a grass-grown embankment lined with rickety wooden shacks roofed with discolored tin each house set upon piles above a pool of filth and reached by a wobbly boardwalk once upon a time when this whole shore from costa rica to guatemala was a part of the british mosquito kingdom of which british honduras is the only remnant this was a thriving city walker the filibuster made it his base of supplies in the days of the gold rush to california nicaragua was one of the favorite cross-continental routes in those times as the residents of today expressed it Greytown was Greytown. Now it was only Greytown. Prosperity had fled. The inhabitants lived, as tropical natives so frequently live, without visible occupation. A visitor, especially a gringo, was a curiosity. The entire population, descendants of Great Britain's former Negro empire, rushed to the doorways to stare buxom winches climbed upon their window-sills with a mountainous display of anatomy to ask one another in jamaican english who oh, de man is who oh, de man is i found the lodging-house but it was closed they all go off for a lark advised a neighbor but eventually i found another hotel kept by a nicaraguan who was quite amazed at the sight of a prospective guest he had one large room laden with canvas cots and already occupied by a blind negro with the stupid countenance of a half-wit who proved upon further acquaintance to be the town celebrity he was a musician when some one led him downstairs and placed a mandolin in his hands he played it as i had never dreamed the instrument could be played he was a true genius if his accompanist gave the wrong chord upon the guitar he would fly into a rage when as a joke someone told him that i played better than he his indignation knew no limit his eyelids snapped open and shut exposing empty sockets and he screamed like a maniac he refused positively to play another piece so long as i was present thereafter he seemed to sense my return even when i tiptoed into the room and would cease abruptly to demand in spanish has that gringo come back but he warmed toward me when the mediators informed him that i wished to take his picture all greytown was eager to be photographed seeing my camera the blacks would call out draw me potter sir there were many old colored men here who could recall the days when greytown flourished they were very dignified and formal as befits a patriarch and with the peculiar vanity of the oldest living resident everywhere each was extremely proud that he hadn't had sufficient ambition to move out of one place for sixty or seventy years they now spent most of their time sitting about the rum shops waiting for someone to buy them a drink as i passed one such shop and it seemed to be about the one kind of shop in the city a group of my former associates from the launch journey greeted me with an overjoyed paisano and called me inside assuring the colony of patriarchs this gringo is a good fellow he's our paisano he's one of us with that recommendation the darkies accepted me as an equal theirs was the elaborate phraseology of the jamaican when i first see he they said i presumption that he be american and to me am i not conclusive sir that you'll be a traveller and that you will embrace the primary opportunity to emigrate from this region my former associates were rather tipsy with rum and all were eager to show me the sights of the city the only point of interest they could think of however was the chapel across the way it had fallen greatly into disrepair since the church of england is a more favoured institution on the east coast but it contained a well-moulded image of the saviour some local artist evidently had done the work for the complexion of the image was a rich chocolate brown the natives looked upon him with astonishment caramba exclaimed one it's as dark as ourselves he's our paisano End of chapter 16, part 1
Chapter 16 of A Gringo in Manana Land by Harry L. Foster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 A Long, Long Way to Costa Rica. Part 2. 5. A motor schooner was about to leave for Costa Rica. Its skipper was a Cayman Islander, a hard faced ruffian with a whiskey shaded mustache, who might have passed for a white man were it not for his Jamaican speech its crew was composed of semi-naked blacks but all of them understood seamanship which was fortunate for the passing of the red bar at the mouth of the san juan is fraught with danger we crept out through a winding channel giant combers sweeping across the low sand spit caught us broadside and turned the little craft until the gunwale dipped water again and again they piled us against the opposite bank while great sheets of spray broke over us and sizzled through the rigging the skipper braced against the wheel shouted orders that flew to leeward with the screaming wind the blacks seemingly unmindful of their peril leaned their weight upon their poles as they struggled to pry us loose while a dozen sharks cruised hungrily below natives affirm that the sea tigers gather about each passing ship and are seldom disappointed there were moments when it appeared that they might enjoy their accustomed banquet but at last we were safe and climbing up the mountainous waves toward the open sea while the boatmen raised lusty voices in a chanty of the old-time pirates and with a stiff breeze filling out sails we scudded southward toward costa rica the most charming land in the world six five years earlier i had visited costa rica after my flight from mexico and it was good to see it again we threaded our way among the reefs of limon harbour toward a sickle of white beach fringed with graceful cocoa palms in the distance rose lofty mountains verdant with forest and jungle towering up and up toward the filmy white clouds over it all was the bluest of skies this was the land which admiring spaniards years ago christened rich coast and no country has ever been more aptly named limon itself was merely an average east coast port a city of rickety wooden houses behind a large banana wharf with a population of jamaican blacks imported by the fruit company which owns this caribbean shore but the railway incidentally a fruit company possession and one of the three most famous scenic routes in latin america carried me inland through an ever-changing panorama of cane fields banana plantation thatched villages and untrammeled jungle through forests of magnificent big trees festooned with moss and vine through rugged gulches beside a foaming river up mountain sides where the stream dropped to a mere white ribbon far below along winding cliffs that looked out upon endless vistas of waving palm tops up into the exhilarating coolness of the altitudes among rolling hills of luxuriant coffee plantation past the red-tiled roofs of ancient cartago and down again into a fertile valley dotted with little farms into san jose the most delightful capital in central america a city of quaint spanish architecture yet with every modern comfort a quiet peaceful city slumbering beneath a warm sun that never burns a city with the loveliest climate the most attractive plazas and the most beautiful women in the world every town of any note in latin america claims these superlatives as its own every traveller i have met joins me in awarding them to san jose seven costa rica is not only the most charming country in central america but usually the best behaved so stable is its government that land upon the costa rican side of the san juan river is far more valuable than the same sort of property on the nicaraguan side it is one of the few countries south of the rio grande which can elect a new president without shooting the old one its leading families are so interrelated that the chief executive ship is largely a household affair as a general rule they take turns at it now and then when they do quarrel about it each family separates half of it taking one side and half the other so that everybody always wins 
and whoever gains the office rules ordinarily with consideration for the rest of the populace in many recent years there has been but one period of rough house in its ordinarily tranquil history it was my fortune on my first visit to the republic to arrive just in time to witness its conclusion the conclusion of such a series of events as might have sprung from the pages of a novel by richard harding davis i landed at puerto limon just in time to see ex-president federico tinoco the last of the central american tyrants walk across the dock between two lines of fixed bayonets and embark for europe carrying with him the national treasury the story of tinoco would be much more typical of honduras than of costa rica as in Tegucigalpa, there were three contestants for the presidency in the election of 1919. No one of them gained an absolute majority. Congress, forced to decide, bickered as Congress's will. The president in office, scenting possible trouble, undertook to smooth the path of his own favorite by building up a stronger army. At the head of it was Federico Tinoco, a man of prominent family, himself little known in Costa Rica, except as a devotee of pleasure who spent most of his time in Paris. When the army was well organized, Tinoco cleared the whole situation by capturing the palace and declaring himself president. Thereupon he reorganized Congress with his own personal friends and was constitutionally elected. There were rumors, as always in these countries, that an American concession hunter financed the whole coup. It is more probable that Tinoco's family influenced the move. Federico, the dictator, was himself a weak, timid, vacillating man. The real power behind the throne was a younger brother, Joaquin, who became the secretary of war. Young, cultured, charming, the handsomest man in a nation of handsome men, Joaquin was a striking figure everywhere. Magnetic beyond description, he could, in a five-minute conversation, bring his worst enemy to his own point of view. He had traveled throughout the world, had been received in the most exclusive salons of many European capitals, and spoke fluently several languages. He could outride, outwrestle, outbox, outfence, and outswim any youth in the Republic. At philandering, he was supreme. Now and then some outraged husband challenged him to a duel, but Joaquin could outshoot them all. When there were murmurs against the high-handed methods by which the Tinocos had obtained office, he announced in Congress, If any citizen disapproves of it, he can meet me man to man with revolvers. Secure in his power, Joaquin led the life of a young prince. He designed strikingly beautiful uniforms for himself. He gave many gay parties. He himself never drank, but there was always plenty of champagne for his friends. He made costly presents to his women, and not content with the local beauties, he imported occasional high-class courtesans from overseas. His extravagances proved a drain upon the national treasury. When President Federico protested, Joaquin quickly overruled him and federico despite his desire to execute honestly the duties into which family ambition had forced him proceeded to tax the country exorbitantly when the peons had no money left he took their oxen he confiscated the beasts under pretense of using them for the army but sold them to cattlemen in the west indies the reserves in the local banks he seized to pay the interest on the national debt at length he commenced to sell some of the art treasures in the national theater it was his one remaining hope to secure a foreign loan before capitalists would listen to his pleas however he must secure the recognition of the american government in his efforts to win the favor of washington he used every possible device he extended every courtesy to american citizens he joined the united states in declaring war on germany he offered our war department the use of costa rica territory and the fortification of the canal zone his stumbling block was benjamin f chase american consul in san jose in the absence of a minister mr chase was reporting to washington the current political history of costa rica being a stubborn sort of yankee he was reporting the truth even though the Tinocos tried to make a pet of him. 
having failed to bribe the consul according to rumors afloat at the time the dictator is said to have hired another gringo to shoot him several of the more loyal americans formed themselves into a guard at the consulate and the consul continued to send home unfavorable reports on the tinoco regime all costa rica murmured its discontent at the increasing taxation revolutions commenced to brew in the suppression of the uprisings joaquin introduced a reign of terror his spies were everywhere political opponents were thrown into old-fashioned wooden stocks and exhibited in public the prisons were filled according to reports prisoners were frequently beaten with iron rods and sometimes hung up by the thumbs many of the stories have the exaggerated ring of the yarns told about cabrera in guatemala they include those of a man burned in oil of gold teeth being extracted and resold to dentists and of a private swimming pool where joaquin after depriving his prisoners of water for forty-eight hours would march them out to see him diving and swimming in gallons of it the leading revolutionist don julio acosta had a force of two hundred men on the nicaraguan border but joaquin's army numbered about ten thousand the revolutionists had neither arms nor ammunition washington following its traditional policy of selling weapons only to constitutionally elected presidents whether they were crooks or not refused to sell to don julio insisting that he work out his own salvation indirectly it was tinoco's large army that caused his own destruction knowing that all costa rica hated him he had strengthened it with soldiers of fortune from nicaragua and honduras of the type who gravitate wherever there is trouble they must be paid all other government employees could wait the school teachers in protest left their schools and marched through the streets with their pupils emboldened by their example the letter carriers and the street cleaners followed when the police sought to disperse them the women cried we are your friends we are protesting against the cutting of your salaries to pay foreign soldiers and the police stood back while all san jose surged through the streets shouting down with the tonocos joaquin at the time was absent from the city hearing of the disturbance he hastened back and led his troops in person riding fearlessly into the mob some of the women and children were forced into the american consulate and surged upstairs to the balcony a young boy attempted a speech tinoco soldiers drew their rifles and fired the crowd fled back inside the building leaving consul chase alone on the balcony eleven bullet holes dented the stucco behind him but he was not harmed this was the beginning of the end joaquin quickly pacified the city for no one dared to face him but the old-timers suspect a little note came down from washington federico the nominal dictator made plans for an exit he handed his resignation to the vice-president who appointed him ambassador at large to europe with a salary of a hundred thousand dollars a year payable in advance all of his cohorts received similar appointments by a procedure which if unethical was quite proper according to international law until their salaries exhausted what little cash remained in the country joaquin the real dictator had no intention of fleeing with them whatever might be said of him he was no coward he meant to fight to the end but the end came unexpectedly he was strolling nonchalantly down the street one evening when a man saluted him always military joaquin snapped his own hand to his hat brim he did not observe that the other man had saluted with the left hand or that the right concealed a revolver as joaquin's fingers touched the hat brim the man shot him then he turned and ran up the street blazing into the air and shouting joaquin is dead costa rica lives the elder tinoco was at home in the castle when the news reached him seizing the telephone he called up the prison shoot every political prisoner he ordered but with the death of joaquin a change had come over the republic it was joaquin the people feared and not federico the order was not obeyed 
surrounded by foreign soldiers of fortune the ex-dictator emerged from the castle only to attend his brother's funeral then in a heavily guarded train he fled to puerto limon and sailed for europe as was my usual fortune in latin american travel i arrived just in time to hear the shouting and all costa rica was shouting when i drew any young man aside to ask who it was that shot joaquin he would glance hastily about to see that he was not overheard and then he would whisper shh don't tell any one i did it but joaquin had his mourners every day several young ladies would visit his grave to deck it with flowers each glaring jealously at the others who loved his memory eight this story it should be emphasized again is not typical of costa rica although the second smallest of the central american republics it is the most progressive fortune favored it in the beginning by giving it few gold mines to attract to its shores the swashbuckling adventurer whose blood to-day keeps so many of the neighboring countries in turmoil it is essentially a country of coffee and bananas and so fertile that wooden railway ties and telegraph poles are popularly reputed to take root and grow it was settled not by conquistadores bent upon enslaving the indian but by galejos the hardest working farmers of spain who instead of mating with the aborigines followed the example of our own puritan forefathers by exterminating them Today, when one passes the black fringe of the caribbean coast one finds neither the indian population of guatemala nor the mixed breed population of the other countries but a race eighty per cent spanish even among the lowly peons not being troubled by recurrent civil war costa rica has made progress it is not an astounding country for most of its twenty three thousand square miles of territory are still clad with jungle and its population of four hundred thousand people live mostly in one mountain district where the four principal cities are connected by a wagon road not more than thirty miles in length but its people for the most part own their own farms and are contented education is of a higher standard than in the other countries there is railway connection with either coast it is such a healthful land that canal zone doctors always recommend it to convalescents it has a national theatre which equals in its interior decoration any theatre in the united states yet it remains quaint and picturesque and spanish charming and delightful so thoroughly charming and delightful that the author after living there for a month on two different visits discovers no further observations in his notebook nine to be fair to these countries no story of revolution is altogether typical of any of them life even in mexico or honduras is normally tranquil bloodshed and comic opera are not the rule but the exception if all of these republics have their turbulous moments they quickly recover after the flight of tinoco costa rica settled quickly into its accustomed routine through the narrow moorish streets the oxen plodded slowly behind the driver's goad pole their noses to the ground their massive shoulders swaying from side to side in the coffee fields outside the capital the peons laughed and chatted as they filled their baskets with red berries in the plaza the military band played on sunday evenings while youths and maidens strolled beneath the palm trees and the same moon that smiled upon mexico peeped over the low flat roofs while the plaintive notes of the gendarmes whistle echoed through the quiet city with its benediction of all's well End of chapter 16 part 2chapter seventeen of a gringo in manana land by harry l foster this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen adios one a fruit steamer carried me back to new orleans after several months of travel in mexico and central america travel marked by many delays by many postponements until manana by many controversies with petty officials and by many struggles with the pompous formality of diminutive republics one looked forward to landing again in an anglo-saxon country the steamer docked at eight in the evening the emigration inspector had gone home 
how soon may we land the passengers inquired to-morrow was the answer we spent the next several hours filling out an inventory of our personal baggage for the benefit of the customs service foreigners answered a lengthy questionnaire containing such queries as are you an anarchist are you a polygamist and do you believe in the overthrow of the united states government by force the only officials that were on the job were the prohibition agents they came aboard in search of liquor so the captain took them to his cabin and opened a bottle of scotch two on the pullman that carried me northward to new york a travelling man engaged me in conversation i see you've been to south america i noticed the nicaragua label on your suitcase how's things down there pretty wild bunch ain't they and he laid aside his newspaper which contained accounts of one lynching one fist fight on the floor of congress four fashionable divorce scandals one ku klux klan outrage sixteen robberies two incendiary fires seven murders and the innumerable charges and countercharges of bribery and corruption which distinguish a presidential campaign three perhaps since in my first chapter my destination was panama i ought to mention it i stopped there for several weeks after my first flight from mexico the canal zone regarded as an example of what anglo-saxon efficiency can do to the tropics was quite astounding the once fever-stricken swamp had become a well-ordered garden of palm-shaded walks lined with neat cottages the screening which enclosed each dwelling was no longer necessary the malaria-bearing mosquito had departed in the big ditch steamers were handled with the regularity of clockwork they ploughed into the huge locks giant doors swung shut behind them water poured as though by magic into the artificial pool raising the vessels to the higher level of gotten lake the doors opened the ships steamed away toward the pacific everything in the zone ran smoothly with the same mechanical precision that marked the operation of the canal but nowhere in the americanized territory did one find the quiet contentment of the latin countries whenever the american employees wished to enjoy life they crossed the boundary into the republic of panama to the land of music and tinkling fountains martini cocktails and dark-eyed senoritas four among the many letters awaiting me at home there was one with a mexican postmark it was from the long-lost eustace it said i suppose you'll wonder why i haven't written you before the fact is i've fallen into the swing of things down here and keep putting everything off until manana after i left you in mexico city that day ever so long ago i reached manzanillo without difficulty there was nothing thrilling about my escape i simply boarded a steamer and sailed away for a couple of years after that i damned mexico and made fun of it and talked about its many faults i told the story of our heroic flight from zamora and later from carranza until i was bored with it myself the funny thing is that i presently began to hanker to go back there's something about mexico you can't explain it and as soon as carranza gave place to Obregón, i went back i'm cashier now at a mine in durango it belongs to that chap werner we met in mazatlan once in a while the peons get drunk and shoot each other up but as a rule everything's quiet there's an air of peace and calm and ease and leisure that you don't find at home at first it gets a gringo's goat then he accustoms himself to it and likes it he doesn't have to answer an alarm clock or rush for a subway train or reach an office at a prescribed hour or dash out for a hasty bite of lunch between business engagements or punch a time clock or take efficiency tests or come home hanging to a trolley strap he can settle any troublesome question in the native fashion by postponing it until manana i like these people too there's nothing much that a gringo can say to their credit but when you get into their ways they're mighty likable and i've gotten completely into their ways i'm married no it wasn't lolita when i reached mazatlan i found that venner had married her when he went around to break the news of our fictitious death he got acquainted and stepped off with my old sweetheart so i've married herminia i've told her that our cablegram was sheer bunk 
and that you're still alive but the news no longer seems to thrill her although she would like to be remembered to you it looks like i'm settled here for life whenever i suggest taking a trip back to california herminia is frightened stiff everyone down here considers the old u s too dangerous a place to visit just as we get mostly the bandit stories from mexico so they get all the train robberies and lynching news from home just as our people regard all mexicans as chronic revolutionists so the mexicans look upon us as a lot of bank looters who when not professionally occupied take our diversion in chasing colored people and stringing them to lamp-posts i've just received word that our old friend barlow is dead do you remember how pessimistic he was about the dangers of mexico always carrying a gun and warning everybody to take no chances he went home to the States last month and died from drinking wood alcohol. Some time ago I met a former acquaintance of ours. It was that oily little fellow that came to our room in Mexico City, Mario Sanchez, aide to His Excellency Venustiano Carranza. I lent him the price of a square meal. He had lost his job when Carranza ducked out of the capital with Obregón after him we got rather chummy and i asked him whether he really had been planning to murder us and what do you think carranza himself believed that yarn about our being captured by zamora he merely wanted to give us each five hundred dollars to keep quiet about it and to think we both went scampering out of mexico and wondered why no one stopped us but i'm pretty well satisfied with the way things have turned out and this brings me to the main reason for coming out of my lethargy to write a letter i do so from sheer pride i've become a parent very much so it's twins all of which goes to prove your old contention that this is a country whose charm lies in its habit of providing the unexpected so good luck and adios end of chapter seventeen end of a gringo in manana land by harry l foster